Hey there, welcome to today's video where I want to share with you some examples where mushroom cultivation is being used to reduce poverty and malnutrition in different places around the world. So let's begin with a couple of facts. There are 700 million people living in extreme poverty around the world. Now the good news is this has fallen massively. It used to be 36% of the world's population living in extreme poverty back in 1990. That's reduced down to about 10%. There's still 10% too many. And the interesting thing when you look into it is it really is spread quite unevenly around the world. So more than half of those living in extreme poverty are based in sub-Saharan Africa. And of those 700 million living in extreme poverty, half live in just five countries. And that's India, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. So you've got a lot of variation in terms of where people are really suffering in poverty like this. And when it comes to malnutrition, there are 800 million people around the world who are undernourished. Many of them are children. So approximately 45% of the deaths of children under the age of five is linked to undernutrition. Now, malnutrition is a really complex issue. I'm not gonna get into it in much detail. There's lots of different factors that can lead to somebody being undernourished. But in many cases, it's to do with the distribution of food. There's plenty of food being produced in the world. It's just not very well distributed in certain areas. And in many areas where you see undernourishment, the diet that people are eating is just missing a lot of vital components. People are often are living just off of uh, cereals almost entirely not much in the way of uh, fruit, vegetables, meat, dairy, um, oils, and so they're lacking really vital nutrients. So the question is how can mushrooms help? And I'm not for a minute gonna stand here and try and pretend that mushrooms are gonna solve all the problems behind this. There's a lot of very complex factors at play here. But what I've seen in the research for this video is numerous projects around the world in many different places where mushrooms are having a positive impact on people and local communities providing food and income. So I just want to take a moment to dig into those and show you some examples as a little bit of inspiration. So there are three reasons in particular why mushrooms can help in this situation. First up is the fact that they're highly nutritious. So I'm just gonna look at oyster mushrooms throughout most of this video because they are one of the most commonly cultivated mushrooms. And oyster mushrooms are a really rich, nutrient dense food. Uh, they're a good source of vitamins B, C and D and they include many important minerals like potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, iron, copper. They're also really high in protein and low in fat. And they have some medicinal properties. Um, they have a lot of antioxidants and there have been many studies indicating that they help in the, the reduction of cancer. So when you have a situation where people are suffering malnutrition, often it's due to a lack of important minerals, for example, like iron, uh, mushrooms actually contain a lot of these nutrients in them, so if people have access to them in their diet, it's adding highly nutritious food that wasn't there before. Secondly, mushrooms can make use of agricultural waste streams. Most areas of the world that are suffering from either hunger or poverty um, are, tend to be agricultural regions and there's an absolute abundance of agricultural byproducts. And oyster mushrooms have been found to grow on more than 200 different types of agricultural waste including some of the most common crops like rice straw, wheat straw, maize, coffee pulp, banana leaves, coconut husks, corn cobs, uh, sugarcane bagasse, sawdust, sunflower husks, uh, a few different types of wild grasses and reeds. Those are just some of the examples of some of the 200 plus different types of agricultural byproduct that you can grow oyster mushrooms on. And in many areas of the world, these uh, byproducts simply have no use they're often burnt in the fields, causing a lot of problems with environmental pollution. And instead, you could take these materials and use them as the substrate to produce nutrient-rich food on instead and make use of this huge waste stream. And on top of that, mushrooms fetch a high value in most places around the world due to the fact that they are nutrient-rich food. So in all the cases that I've looked at in research in this video, you see time and time again numerous positive stories where people are able to lift themselves out of poverty by generating an income through the sale of the mushrooms that they grow. In some cases it's done as a business, the main focus for a family. Uh, in other cases it's kind of a sideline income alongside the other crops that they're growing. And I just want to take a moment to walk you through a couple of examples of the kind of 
income uh, that people are able to experience. So this is an example from Mush World Kenya, uh, which is a Facebook page that I came across in the research, and they were outlining the types of costs that are experienced and the potential profit. And as you can see, you don't need to look at all the numbers here, but basically, um, you know, the cost of all of the inputs to the operation versus the output uh, leaves you with a, a pretty good profit of around about 73%. Obviously, the additional input is people's time, but in many cases, people either have additional time because they don't have enough work, or the time they're putting into other things isn't as profitable as this. And so the profit that can be generated from mushroom cultivation for the time input often makes a lot of sense for people. Here's another example from a case study in Nepal, and it was in a similar sort of region of gross profit around about 70 to 80%. So the point here is that most of the inputs are really cheap. In many cases, the raw substrate material is either free or easily available in the local area. And the main cost input really is the spawn supply. And we'll come back and talk about that a little more in just a moment. But aside from the spawn supply and people's time input, there are very few additional costs. So let's look at three examples from around the world. The first one I want to talk about is a really inspiring lady called Chido Guevara. Chido became an orphan in Zimbabwe at the age of seven. She had a younger brother to take care of and a grandmother and was in a diff very difficult situation. When she was 11, she had an opportunity to take part in a project that Zeri ran in her country, teaching people how to grow mushrooms. So Zeri is a project started by Gunter Pauli, and it st stands for Zero Emissions Research Institute. They did a lot of great work in a number of different projects around the world um, over the last 20 years or so. If you haven't read about them before, I'll put a link below this video and you can go and check out Gunter's work. It's really inspiring. It was certainly something that both Eric and I were inspired by at the beginning of setting up Grow Cycle because they did a lot of work growing mushrooms on coffee grounds. Anyway, Chido went to this workshop at the age of 11. She learned how to grow mushrooms. She brought that back to her village and had a lot of success with it. And she began to train other orphans in her area on this production technique and it was extremely popular. She's since gone on to dedicate the rest of her life to this and she's taught more than 1,000 mainly women from countries all across Africa um, in the technique of mushroom cultivation and helping them to use this to lift themselves out of poverty. She's a super inspiring lady. I'll put a link below this video where you can find out a little bit more about her story. Next up, let's look at mushroom farming in Nepal. So people have been growing mushrooms in Nepal since the 1970s when a go their government ran a program to introduce this form of agriculture to the country, um, mainly because there was an abundance of the agricultural byproducts and there was a need for people to supplement their incomes. And mushrooms fit the bill really well and their government was quite forward thinking in recognizing this and funding a program to spread the growing techniques throughout the country. And the other thing in addition to that is that many areas in Nepal are naturally the right conditions for growing mushrooms. So in some areas they're able to grow mushrooms all year round without much climatic control. In other areas they grow just seasonally when the conditions fit. But you can see in these clips here that the setup, the farms that people are using is fairly basic and they're basically chopping different agricultural byproducts. They're soaking it in water or heating it in water placing into bags and growing and selling the mushrooms. And in much of the research I did, there are countless examples of families talking about how the income from their mushroom cultivation is paying for their children to go to school or to fix their buildings, pay for health care, and just to generally raise their standard of living. And there's a thriving market for mushrooms that more and more farmers are beginning to move into. Last up then, let's look at this example from Rwanda of Kigali Farms. Rwanda has changed a lot since the conflicts of the 1990s, but there's still around about 40% of the population are living in poverty. And this is a really interesting example, I think, of where mushrooms are being utilized as a tool to lift more people out of poverty. So Kigali Farms operates a model that works like this. There's a centralized farm that produces the substrate, grows it in lab-like conditions, and gets it ready to the point where it's ready to fruit. They then supply that to a network of local farmers who then nurture the crop and produce them. And then they have the option to sell them back to Kigali farms who then market and sell the mushrooms, or they can obviously eat them for themselves or sell them in their local area. And it seems to be a real success story. They have hundreds of local 
uh, mushroom farms connected to their network. And from the research I've done, in all cases, the growers are really happy about the situation. They've got this nutrient-rich crop. They love eating the mushrooms and they're producing additional income from the sale of them in the local area or back to the Kigali Farms network. What I love in all of these examples is the fact they're really demonstrating how low-tech mushroom growing can be. Almost in all cases, the actual growing rooms that they're using are fairly basic. They're often just constructed from local materials, whatever is available. So in many cases, that's just from uh, reeds, from bamboo, from leaf thatch, from shade netting, really quite simple structures that are easy to construct, cheap to construct, and that utilize existing local materials. And as we saw in the videos just a minute ago, you can see that most of these spaces are not climate controlled. They're not sterile laboratories. And they basically look nothing like commercial mushroom farms in the West and in industrial nations. Now, probably they don't have the same yields or low contamination rates of an industrialized commercial mushroom farm. But the point here is you can still grow a lot of mushrooms in a low tech way like this. And with very little training, most of the people that are operating farms like this haven't been to school or they've only been to school for the first few years of their life. But with a little bit of training and often some kind of network support from other growers, they're able to run a mushroom farm successfully and produce a crop reliably. And I just love it as a demonstration for just how low tech you can go. It makes our low tech mushroom farm look relatively high tech in comparison. And of course our farm is low tech compared to the higher tech farms that you'll see if you go and visit a commercial mushroom farm operation. And in a way it sort of indicates that there's a sliding scale. There's not really such a thing as high tech and low tech. There's a sliding scale between the two. And you can cultivate mushrooms at any point along that scale. It's simply not true that you need a, a high-tech, industrialized, supplied with electric and climate-controlled mushroom farm. So we've looked at how mushrooms can provide nutritious food, generate income and use agricultural byproducts. But of course it's not without its challenges, especially when you're trying to operate in countries where there's still conflict ongoing. There's often a lack of infrastructure. Um, these are some of the main challenges that people face when they're wanting to grow mushrooms in these environments then. So first up, there's investment. Although the operating costs for growing mushrooms are fairly low, there's almost always some initial investment required in order to build the growing houses, to buy a first batch of spawn and bags in. And in many cases, people just don't have that money available to kickstart the whole thing off. So far, in many of the cases that I've looked at, the projects have been funded either by NGOs that are working in the field and looking for um, basically development projects that they can implement, or they've been funded by the government of the country who's looking to diversify agriculture. But unless you live in a place where either one of these options is open to you, then the opportunity to get started can be limited at times, which is why it's heartening to see the use of um, lending platforms in order to kickstart many micro businesses around the world. So this is an option which is more and more open to people these days. So for example, there are platforms like Kiva, there is another one called Lend With Care, and another called Zidisha, where people can basically use the platform to say, if you lend me this money, I can do this with it. And it basically bridges the gap between people who have no money, and people that have money and want to put it to good. And so I think increasingly you'll be able to see people utilizing these sort of platforms to just lend directly to one another. And at the same time, there are some really innovative NGOs working all over the world. We've been in touch with a couple of them ourselves who are working all across Southern Africa, rolling out a system of containerized food growing in different areas powered by solar. And these are some really smart people working on the projects, really kind of thinking into the future about what sub-Saharan Africa is going to look like and how it can make use of the natural resources that it has to develop in a way that's sustainable and lifts people out of poverty. So another problem that's often faced is spawn supply. Although it's relatively easy to grow mushrooms without a sterile environment if you have the spawn already available, it's not so easy to produce spawn yourself if you don't have a clean environment and it is a lot more complicated than just growing on the substrate. So in many cases people are needing a spawn supply of a pure culture in order to grow from. And traditionally this has really only been available from agricultural institutes that are connected to universities within a country. And so unless that spawn supply is there it basically makes the whole possibility of growing mushrooms pretty difficult. What I've seen through the research here is that in many cases there's a new industry popping up in these countries 
whereby there are businesses who have focused on the spawn supply and then they're supplying this kind of wider network of growers, much like you see all over the rest of the world. And so it's one of those things that once you have a critical mass of growers there, it provides a market for a spawn supplier. And so the more that it happens, the more spawn opportunity that there is. And so hopefully this is a challenge which will become less and less of an issue as time goes on. Another issue is what happens to the produce after harvest. Oyster mushrooms don't have a very long shelf life. They're usually only about three or four days and that's with refrigeration. And in many areas, not only is it really hot, but there's no refrigeration. And so what people tend to do is either try and get them to market straight away, which is obviously the best thing you can do, make use of the mushrooms when they're fresh. Many times they're often dried and preserved in this way. And I also really like some of the innovative solutions for cold storage that I've seen for example, what you can see in the picture here is a solar powered cold storage and they're often community owned so that different farmers can use them and they all chip in and uh, fund the thing together. With the cost of solar panels getting cheaper and cheaper, it's quite possible that we'll see more and more of these cold hubs spread out all over the place. And then finally, one of the other challenges that are often faced is just having a market there that wants to buy the mushrooms. In many cases, mushrooms are not part of the diet of the country traditionally and people are not so familiar with them or they're only familiar with uh, wild harvested mushrooms and they have often a mistrust of whether they're safe or not. So part of the work for most mushroom growers is to find their market and get people interested in wanting to purchase from them. Luckily, mushrooms tend to have a habit of just generating that demand for themselves beyond a certain point. Word of mouth gets around and people are just asking for more number of the studies I looked into, especially the ones in Nepal, people were saying that they get their neighbours just asking them, come on, when are the next mushrooms ready? I want to eat them, I prefer them to meat. And so although it can oftentimes be an unfamiliar part of a diet, when people do come across them and they like cooking and eating with them, it becomes popular quite quickly. As you can probably tell, this is something I'm really passionate about. I find it absolutely fascinating and really inspiring. And so it's something that over the course of the years ahead, we're going to just look at Grow Cycle and, and the way that we teach and use online education platforms and see how we can uh, utilize that to contribute to this in some way. All right, that's it for today's video. Thanks a lot for joining us. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do, and we'll see you in the next one.